Welcome, everybody. I love that music. It was really getting me in the sort of the party mood here. And I'm sure a lot of people are already in that in that mood and in that mode, because from what I understand, there's a lot of holiday festivity going on <laughs> around. And so we want to make sure we uh, have time for our wonderful speaker today. And um, we know some people may be uh, joining us late and and maybe running off to other festivities too. But anyway, it's good to see you all. And um, it's my pleasure to, first of all, introduce myself and then introduce uh, um, the speaker. So welcome to the Center for Health Equity uh, Jam Session for December, 2022. Um, this is our sort of informal gathering where we have, um, researchers, patients, family members, community members, all working uh, towards uh, health equity who can uh, enjoy each other and inspire each other in an informal setting. And we can hear sort of what is the cutting edge work that's being done as well as get feedback uh, from one another uh, about research methods, about community engagement methods, um, and about uh, clinical practice, uh, public health practice uh, to advance health equity. So uh, first of all, I, I know we were enjoying some of that music and we usually get music courtesy of our speaker. So not necessarily that they actually have to perform for us. I saw, I saw his eyes just now. <laughs> But the genre of music is usually a nod to the speaker. So I wonder if you all had some thoughts about that, uh, how many people enjoy that. I didn't actually know the acronym for it, but apparently it's called EDM. So uh, you get a special prize if you know what EDM stands for. <laughs> you can put that in the chat. And um, but tell us about, our, you know, we usually have some informal uh, questions before we, we get going. So, so we can get, we, we, we want to get some guesses about other than EDM, what other kinds of music might our speaker uh, like? So we could put some, just take a look and see whether you have some ideas. Oh, yay, we, we, at least some people know what EDM is. So I knew what it was when I heard it, but I didn't know what it stood for, just full, full transparency. <laughs> Uh, okay, so hey, somebody knows our speaker. Somebody said uh, or has a good guess as jazz. He he did tell us that he likes bop era jazz. Do you want to say anything more about that, Jack? What bop era jazz is? Oh, uh, I uh, so right at EDM in the morning, um, and Oliver Nelson and John Coltrane in the evening to try to to wind back down. Um, I just was also the folks who guessed I might possibly be a father of of children, and so therefore I think everybody who has kids has at some point gone through the Hamilton soundtrack phase, where um, it was all Hamilton all the time, and um, yeah, there's been a fair amount of that too. Okay. Well, some people thought you actually might like um, rock music or opera. <laughs> Not so much opera. There has um, angry young men and women with loud guitars has had a phase in my life on occasion. Uh, okay. So uh, let's see. Our speaker also has an, a couple of interesting hobbies. So um, I would say he's pretty handy with his hands. So how many guesses for what hobby he might have? <laughs> Woodworking. Well, that was a good try, <laughs> but wrong. <laughs> Knitting, pottery, making bread. Okay. Well, we've got a correct answer out there. It's knitting. Um, do you want to tell us about your knitting, Jack? Oh, um, I don't know. So there is somebody on this call who knits, right? Who makes actual things you can wear. I tend to make squares or squares wrapped around themselves that become hats, um, mostly for sort of the 
um, frankly, the occupational therapy part of it. Um, uh, a dear friend recommended to me at the beginning of uh, the epidemic um, as a way of kind of cycling down after what were a few uh, relatively long days in the ICU. And so I, it turns out it, uh, a book on tape or a little jazz and I can just do, um, knit one, purl one for hours on end. Okay. Well, cool. I thought that was pretty cool. Um, handy for this time of year too. So you also said that you have some favorite Baltimore coffee shops. So, but you're looking for some recommendations. So could we get some recommendations for Baltimore coffee shops for Jack? Who else is a coffee connoisseur on here? Zeke's, The Daily Perk, Katango, Good Neighbor, Atwater. So you got a lot of good uh, suggestions here. I was just a good neighbor this morning. That was today's coffee. Good. I've not heard of Red Canoe, One Do, or The Daily Perk. Okay. So we got some good suggestions for you. Tell, what are your favorites so far? Um, so I live over in Bolton Hill, so sort of smack between um, sophomore coffee um, and, and Station North and uh, Babies on Fire in, um, in Mount Vernon and adore them both. Okay, awesome. All right, so let's see. We've got uh, one more fun fact about our speaker, and I'm trying to figure out how I want to introduce this. Hmm. I don't remember what it was. I so I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's something about his head and his hair. Oh. So what's a unique thing about his head and his hair? Nobody's going to guess this. So I'm yeah. going to let you share. If you can remember what you said, if you can, I'll tell you what you said. Oh, I did. So oh, again. Somebody said you've donated hair. Uh, or it changes colors in the summer or had a long ponytail. Good guesses. Yeah. Professor Cruz, I am deeply hurt, <laughs> deeply hurt by that one. Um, although, yeah. Uh, uh, so again, as sort of right, the sort of various maladaptive strategies for dealing with um, the epidemic. Uh, at some point, I decided I wanted to shave my, I might be willing to shave my head just so I could take dial soap to my head at the end of coming home from the hospital and feel clean. Um, and someone was like, I bet people would pay money for pictures for that. And I was like, all right. Um, and so started as a joke on sort of Twitter and with my faculty colleagues, I offered that I would post pictures of sort of myself with a mohawk and assorted other sort of mid-shaving um, horrifying pictures if we raised 5,000 bucks for a domestic violence shelter. And, um, and we blew through that one within like 28 hours. And then people started suggesting that if they raised another 5,000, I would have to shave my beard and we cut off bidding on that. I think that is so creative. I mean, what a wonderful way to, um, you know, just engage people and uh, do something that um, actually is definitely, um, it, you're giving up something, but it, you're also at the same time helping other people. I, I, I just think that's a beautiful story. So Thanks. My sense was, again, at various points in the epidemic that um, particularly there was, a, there was a time when clinicians really needed to do something for somebody else outside of their work. Mm -hmm. um, and this was sort of just a, a vehicle for being able to do that and sort of not think about their work as the only thing they were doing. Well, that was, that was very, very creative and very generous of you. So thank you for sharing that story. So well, I'll move into the sort of a little a little more formal introduction, and then I'll turn over to you. Okay. So our speaker is Dr. Jack Awashna. I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. And I love the way you have so many great descriptions of your work. But um, one of them, well, he he was recruited to Johns Hopkins, and he's a Bloomberg Distinguished Professor here in the schools of medicine and public health, I believe as well. Um, he came here from University of Michigan, where he was and is still a critical care physician and a health services researcher. And what he said on his website from University of Michigan was that um, I'm a critical care physician and health services researcher, 
bringing the tools of social science and outcomes research to improve the care of patients with critical illnesses. Um, and then here at Hopkins, he are in the in the division of pulmonary and critical care medicine, um, and in the, the the Department of Health Policy and Management in the Bloomberg School of Public Health. And you said, I work to help patients and their loved ones heal from critical illness, such as severe infections, including sepsis and COVID-19, respiratory failure and cardiac arrest. And I mentor clinicians be to become exceptional scientists. And that's clearly true because I you can tell from your CV that you've, you've received so many awards uh, and specifically for your, not only for your research, but also for mentorship. So that's one of our core values here in the Center for Health Equity. And we have lots of early stage investigators and young people uh, on the, uh, as that are part of the jam session. And so they would, uh, they, they look, they love meeting with people like you who are committed to mentoring. So without further ado, I'm going to turn over to Dr. Jack Awashna and looking forward to hearing from you today. So thanks so much. Um, this is the inevitable uh, Zoom part where I ask you guys, could somebody give me a thumbs up if you can see my slides and you can see the right screen? Excellent. Uh, uh, thank you so much. Uh, let me do a couple quick disclaimers. Um, the first is a lot of this work uh, comes from an era when I worked for the Department of Veterans Affairs, particularly um, a number of that years was in the previous administration. I'm not sure if the previous administration had an official policy on health equity, but let's just say I do not speak for the current or the previous administration in any of the work that I'm doing. I'm speaking as a private citizen. Um, and that a lot, all of this work, every single slide I'm gonna show you is in some way um, joint work with someone else. Um, in the, one, in the parts where I'm highlighting work that this is explicitly done by a mentee, I'll have them in the upper left corner with a picture of them and some of their contact information. Um, but there's the errors here are often mine and mine alone, uh, but the most of the good ideas are borrowed or taught to me by somebody else. And, um, and frankly, for most of the slides, if you wanna ask me, I can actually tell you who it is who helped introduce, teach me that good thing. Um, uh, my sense is we usually go for about 45 minutes, so it's about 3.15 now. I'll try to wrap up this section by about four, and then I would love to hear uh, comments. Um, I am also, I'm too old. I can't give a talk and monitor the chat at the same time. Um, so if there's something in the chat, I actually need to see if somebody who's younger and better able to multitask can just like wave to me and interrupt me, that would be grateful. All right, so uh, I got a daughter who's in 11th grade. She's doing an English um, essay, and uh, she's been working on her five-paragraph essay. Uh, and as you know, the structure of a five-paragraph essay is I'm going to tell you what I'm going to tell you, I'm going to tell you, and I'm going to tell you what I told you. And so here's where I'm going to tell you what I'm going to tell you. So we just talk very briefly by framing this work a little humbly um, in terms of contemporary social scientific understandings of racism that do not require individual racial animus for racism to produce meaningful differences in whose lives are valued. Then in that context, I'm gonna tell you about pulse oximeters, these little devices that you, you've all seen. Um, any of you in a clinical setting are used to them. Those of you who, uh, who just have a mom or a grandma who is worried about COVID have probably seen one too. And they're a critical medical device used to assess that people need more oxygen. Um, pulse oximeters, I'm gonna show you, overestimate the oxygen levels in black patients and are less precise in black patients. I'm gonna show you about those the data um, that some of my mentees were, were able to contribute to about those two different kind of errors and the way both bias and imprecision happen into this very simple device. Then I'm gonna to talk to you about some ongoing policy discussions, including a mid-November FDA panel um, that's occurring about potentially fixing things but have not actually resulted in any change. And then I want to suggest that technology alone won't solve this or any of the burgoyning field of um, embedded racism in medical devices and algorithms. And there's an urgent need for regulatory interventions to make possible market competition by more equitable devices. And there's a part where I'm going to shamelessly plug to please email me if you are potentially interested in helping to be convene a Hopkins group that has the power of Hopkins rigor 
and the privilege of Hopkins relative independence to try to promulgate what should be evidentiary standards for devices that want to make claims for health equity. I'm going to draw a little bit of an analogy to labeling on food and all the great work that obviously the Hopkins group has done on thinking about how providing people with the right information can help them make informed choices. But let's begin at the beginning by pointing out that I am not Lisa Cooper. I am not Deirdre Cruz. I'm not John Jackson. I'm not any of the titans of the field of health equity who you guys are used to hearing on these Wednesday afternoons. And while I try to think that I'm not a health equity tourist, this has been a sustained area of interest for me. I do want to acknowledge that I am very much here as a learner and somebody who, um, who who's just honestly like incredibly privileged and um, thrilled to be here because I don't really feel qualified to be here, um, but I'm going to show you some work and I look forward to a, a robust conversation where I'll, um, I, I'm quite sure I'll learn uh, far more than I answer. Um, in order to think about this work, particularly in a medical setting, it's useful to understand sort of how, what do I mean by racism? And for me, I find Dr. Benilla Silva from Duke's work on racism without racists and colorblind racism incredibly interesting for thinking how in the intensive care unit space that I do most of my clinical work in, um, you can still have pervasive racism in a world that doesn't necessarily depend as much on interactional hate or interactional bias. Not that those aren't real and, and very common, but I just don't think they're sufficient, right? And so Dr. Benilla Silva talks about colorblind racism as the exclusion from opportunities and resources of people socially classified as black by actions that do not explicitly reference race, but will have disproportionate impacts and benefits on, by race. And of course, that is closely related, sorry, my mouse is choosing not to work with notions of systemic racism, right? Which again, I, this group, I'm just kind of showing my credentials here and helping orient you. I'm not teaching you anything you don't already know about systemic racism, right? The creation and persistence of racialized differences in access to opportunities and resources that function without the need for individual racial hate or prejudice. And of course, um, a prime example of that is differential sorting into uh, healthcare opportunities. And one of the things uh, we saw so painfully in COVID and that we saw right in real time, and I, I practiced in the early parts of the epidemic in Southeast Michigan, in the gap between um, Ann Arbor and Detroit, um, that the quality of care, that African-American patients were disproportionately seeking care at hospitals that were less able to provide high quality care um, for COVID for a variety of reasons. This is some work from David Ash, where they did a simulation. And they basically just said, if you move people who had all the same individual level effects to hospitals with different hospital level effects, that um, from the, the hospitals where African-American patients were disproportionately segregated because of geographic segregation into an average hospital that served mostly white folk, um, and you'd have an over one point absolute decrease in mortality, right? And nearly uh, 1 12th, 1 13th decrease in mortality in the initial COVID wave of deaths. And in the, this context, um, there's a, a quote by Dr. Um, Crystal Fleming that, that I found useful to really kind of anchor my, my thinking, right? And she, she argues that, you know, there's a racial order in which we live that has a name. It's called white supremacy. Again, and this is not news to the uh, people who choose to spend um, their Wednesdays in the health equity jam session. White supremacy is a social, political, and economic dominance of people socially defined as white. White supremacy is about power. And this is the line that just, it just haunted me. The bottom line is that white supremacy is about resources. Who gets and retains access to them? Who gets excluded? Whose lives are made to matter? And whose lives are rendered disposable? And that whose lives are made to matter and whose lives are rendered disposable has been a, a core theme in my work for the last 20 years. But particularly in the context of COVID, very naturally led to, to two um, questions. The first is, who are our healthcare systems choosing to serve? And what are the service priorities? And how are those, although notionally, entirely about things like insurance or diseases that aren't explicitly racially coded, are nonetheless reliably racially coded? And then medical devices. 
um, particularly in the context of uh, pulse oximeters, but there's been a range of other advices. And how do these seemingly racial blind decisions about network and service provider priorities or medical devices lead to predictable disproportionate access and who our health systems make it easy to save and who our health systems make it hard to save. So let's talk about pulse oximeters, right? So I'm an ICU doc, and when I'm not an ICU doc, I used to be a pulmonary um, doc as well. I only practice in the intensive care unit. So I essentially never interact with a patient who doesn't have a pulse oximeter on them. Um, and so, uh, so oxygen, it's like really important. Dr. Cooper, are there likely students on the, uh, on, the, on the call? Can I ask them? Could some of you guys um, type into the chat, what happens if you don't get enough oxygen? I see some current, uh, I see some current medical students tuned in. Um, I see some pre-medical students. So yeah, I think you're in good company. All right, <laughs> Professor Cruz, is anybody actually answering my question or are they just sitting there quietly waiting for me to call on them even though I can't figure out how to call on them? Someone typed in brain death. Um, we have someone brain damage, not good. <laughs> yeah, right. So like you don't need to be an intensive care unit doc to know that oxygen's like really important, right? Like you really need to get enough oxygen. It's kind of important for all your organs. And in order to know if people are getting enough oxygen, there are two things we can do. The first is we can do what's called an arterial blood gas. And all of our young trainees will remember the first time they did an arterial blood gas. Even some of our more seasoned clinicians may remember the first time they did maybe G and successfully got it to flow. Um, it's important, right? You jab people in the artery, you take arterial blood out and you measure it directly. Um, that gives you an, a gold standard measure of how much oxygen is in people's blood, but you have to jab them in the artery to get it. So in the 1980s, um, when a Japanese physician invented the notion of a pulse oximeter, there was wide excitement. And the exact technology of this takes a lot to explain, but suffice it to say, your blood turns different colors when it has enough oxygen in. A blood with lots of oxygen in it, as many of you on this call will know, is bright red. Blood without enough oxygen in it is darker, um, is a darker bluish purple. And there's two kinds of blood in your finger at each time. There's the arterial blood, which has sort of the oxygen that we care about being delivered, and that your heart is beating, and so it's pulsatile. And then there's the stuff that's the runoff that's not pulsatile, that your, your body's already just returning to your heart. And we're interested in trying to figure out how much oxygen the arterial blood and so they figured out you could actually take advantage of the range of saturation, the range of absorption of the light that's coming in the pulsatile part. And if you do some fancy signal processing, you can turn that into a percent saturation that in some cases will very reliably reproduce how much oxygen people have on an arterial blood gas, but in real time on a beat to beat basis without having to stick up. Love it, love this device. And it turns out we use it for all kinds of things, right? So again, as many of you on the call know, um, in order to decide whether or not you get uh, remdesivir, the clinical trial on that was gated on a pulse oximeter. Um, triage, deciding whether or not you're going to get an ambulance. And if you're going to get an ambulance, whether you're gotten to an emergency room, pulse oximeter is a ubiquitous device used for setting priorities. And people whose pulse oximeter readings are high are normal, sit in waiting rooms or get told to take a taxi. People whose pulse oximeters are low get brought right back because there's this aphorism about ABCs, airways, breathing, circulation. Before you do anything else, you got to make sure they get enough air into their airway. And pulse oximeters are a way that's routinely decided. It's not just, of course, in the emergency setting. Many of your grandmothers as well may have sleep apnea. Their sleep apnea and the, um, the device they get, a CPAP machine, is titrated to what's called an apnea hypopnea index. An apnea hypopnea index, and again, I know most of the clinicians know this, so I'm just doing this for the, sort of the medical students, right? It's how many times your pulse oximeter drops below 88 
per hour during your sleep. And, um, and that's bad because you're not getting enough oxygen. And so a, a CPAP machine helps people get enough oxygen. Also, if you need home oxygen, the standard test for that is a six minute walk test. And CMS mandates a pulse oximeter is the thing that determines whether or not they will pay for your home oxygen. We use this thing all over the place. Um, of course, if you're at this point in the talk, you're probably beginning to get a little uncomfortable with that and going to ask me like, oh, this is going to go bad, right? We're probably not going to get, Dr. Cooper probably did not invite Jack to give an hour long talk about like, it works great. It's totally equitable. <laughs> it's not. So let's look at some of that data. So um, for the first wave of the pandemic, uh, University of Michigan, when the surgeon closed the operating rooms, uh, changed its transfer policies and started accepting patients to multiple ICUs who had COVID-19 um, from around Southeast Michigan. And, um, and our ICUs at Michigan went from being 85% white to being about 50% white. And very, very soon thereafter, nurses and attendings started complaining that the, the dang pulse oximeters didn't work anymore that they were starting to see these big discrepancies between what you were seeing on the pulse oximeter, where the pulse oximeter would read somebody was normal and the blood gas would read uh, abnormal. And they didn't know why. And we had lots of conversations about microvascular thrombi in COVID and whether there were some components of like COVID as a distinctive disease uh, that actually resulted in this. And maybe this was hy happy hypoxemia. Um, there's a lot of conversation. And then uh, uh, Professor Amy Moran Thomas from MIT published this piece in Boston Review, where she reviewed some data suggesting there was racial bias in pulse oximeters that we knew from 2005 and 2007. And she talked about uh, when her husband um, got a pulse oximeter at home. She's an anthropologist who works at MIT. And so she went reading about this device that she'd been given to help uh, keep her husband safe. It was like, um, it might not work so well for my husband. And she published this and uh, Victor uh, Ray, who's a, a brilliant sociologist at the University of Iowa tweeted about it. And I saw that sometime when I was sitting waiting in the hospital and I texted it to my colleague, Mike Schroding and said, this can't be true, right? Um, and thinking this was another classic example of sociologic overreach, not understanding the nuance of medical devices. Cause I was a full professor in pulmonary critical care medicine. And Michael Schoding was an assistant professor in pulmonary critical care medicine. And surely if these devices were biased, someone would have taught us that at some point during our training. So Mike's uh, text me back, uh, text me back two minutes later going, I don't know, I got the date on my computer. I think I can do it because Mike's brilliant and a brilliant Python coder and, and had essentially the match stuff. And so he took, um, he had all the arterial blood gases and he had all the pulse oximetry data. And those of you who do SQL, you know, joining the two of those by a date, by a date and time stamp is not a complicated maneuver. And so we did that initial join and said, sent, text me back 20 minutes and said, oh my God, uh, more soon. And, um, and there's a big gap. And so then we spent a couple months like really meticulously cleaning the data. But what Mike did uh, fundamentally was look at patients who were in the ICU where they get continuous arterial blood gas monitoring, sorry, where they get continuous pulse oximetry monitoring and they intermittently get blood gases and just said, every time we drew up blood gas, let's see what their pulse oximeter read at that same time. Uh, and because we collect a lot of data in the ICU, that's all they did. And then what he did, and this is not complicated math, right? He just said, and here we have it on the horizontal axis. What did your, what was the SAT on your pulse oximeter? Was it 92, 93, 94, 95, 96? Those numbers that we think are just fine. Or was it less than 88? Which is, you know, a failing grade for oxygen, just like it was a failing grade for my father. It's got to be at least 92 or above, usually always above 88. And then we just looked at what the saturation on the gold standard arterial blood gas was at the same time. And in blue, you see the data for white patients. The higher your, art, the higher your pulse oximeter was, the higher your average arterial blood gas was. And there, it's a relatively tight distribution and it marches up pretty nicely. But then you look for African-American patients. And um, 
And you see some disturbing stuff here, right? So the first is, despite there being relatively fewer African-American patients, the spread actually looks wider. And very consistently, whatever the pulse oximeter is reading, the actual amount of oxygen in the blood for African-American patients is lower. Indeed, by the time that you're getting to 91%, which the clinicians in the room, I think will agree with me, or is largely a, that's a fine level of blood gas. Uh, whatever's going on, I am not starting to look um, for an oxygen reason for that. I'm interested in something else. The median true arterial saturation is less than 88, is in the, oh my God, I need to look for these problems. Um, right, that by the time you get down to 89, 90, the, almost all of those pulse oximeter readings, which clinically we would interpret as low normal, not great, but not something I need to fix right away, are in fact in the abnormal range, in the range where I need to give them oxygen right now and I stop and do nothing else until I give them oxygen. And so um, this was published in the New England Journal. Um, uh, as a very simple component, uh, he replicated as well in a second um, national data set that showed this, um, the same big, on average, two percentage point uh, misreading in African-American patients that leads to significant levels of what he called occult hypoxemia. So an occult hypoxemia, you can think of as sort of a false normal, right? In fact, your patient's not, my patient's not getting enough oxygen in their blood, but the pulse oximeter is reading, particularly net, so their true sat is 88 or less, but the pulse oximeter is reading 92 or above, right? And so it's that big discrepancy, right? Which seems is actually potentially a, a, a great example of systematic racism, right? The creation and persistence of racialized difference in access to opportunities and resources like oxygen, without the need for individual racial hate or prejudice. And even though there's only this two percentage gap, because it occurs in a crucial range, you get very big differences. So that 3.6% of white patients, their readings between 92 and 96% on pulse oximeter were actually dangerously low. That's kind of at that level that it's not great, but we're used to functioning with. In contrast, 11.7%, of black patients whose pulse oximeter was reading 92 to 96 actually had a blood gas saturation of 88 or less at that same time. In the replication data, 3.6% versus 11.4%. In that difference between, I'm not even thinking about oxygen as the primary reason for why this patient's sick in front of me, to I need to get them oxygen immediately, this is a medical emergency. So uh, shortly afterwards, Massimo, one of the three largest companies um, in the United States that owns the entire market on pulse oximeters, um, Joe Kenny, who's the, um, the CEO, published this piece in the uh, Orange County Business Journal, where he raised a number of concerns about our science, um, entitled, Pulse Oximeters Are Not Racist. This is the picture uh, that he included in the editorial that he got to write in the Orange County Business Journal. He picked for himself demonstrating that he and his uh, family had protested the Black Lives Matter in Laguna Beach, and it had a, a photographer there to take pictures of them doing that. And they used that as evidence that, that we had to be wrong. At the same time, uh, we'll come back to the content of his critiques in a moment. Um, Daniel Kalan Hidalgo, who's a brilliant uh, young pulmonary critical care faculty member at the Denver, started digging into the literature. And we knew about the 2005 and 2007 papers. And uh, Danny goes, like, oh my God, we've known about this since 1990. Um, and, and sends us this paper. And so this is a, it's a brilliant paper by Amal Gibran and Martin Tobin. Martin Tobin is one of the, the gods of the American Thoracic Society, incredibly revered. The standard mechanical ventilation textbook um, for years was his textbook. Uh, went and did uh, the same thing. Uh, they did it prospectively. They took blood gases on patients who were in their ICU um, and compared the actual amount of oxygen measured as a pressure. Again, sort of 60 is the magic number we use against people who had a SAT of 92%. And they color-coded the dots. And as you can see, um, consistently among people who had a SAT of 92%, very consistently white patients 
had a higher uh, true oxygen level in their blood than black patients. They went and actually kind of graphed these out. These graphs are switched versus the ones I showed you on the previous. So the, the pulse oximeter sat is on the vertical axis. Um, the oxygen, the true blood gas is on the horizontal axis. And as you can see, there's, right, you can just eyeball. There's that solid line down the middle. That's what well calibrated looks like. And very clearly, the black dots are more off that line of good function than the white dots off. And they're off in the direction that the pulse oximeter misses low oxygen levels in black patients in 1990, published by one of the titans of our field. And then Amy Moran Thomas goes and does the anthropology thing again. And this is right why getting to work in a university setting is so amazing. Turns out she goes on eBay and you can buy an old NASA pulse oximeter um, from Hewlett Packer from the late 60s, uh, which were explicitly designed, even though NASA was quite segregated back at that time, uh, to still be able to work across a wide range. So it's not that we can't make pulse oximeters that are not accurate across a range of different patients. It's that we've chosen not to because this device that she's got has got more electrodes than, and more LEDs than the one uh, that we routinely use in the ICU and so it's more expensive. And so um, at this point, right, I've published one paper um, and Sue Dynarski, who's uh, a professor up at Harvard, has this amazing phrase. She said, one of the lessons she learned in her longstanding campaign to simplify financial aid um, is that as academics, we're trained not, not, to, not to keep repeating the same thing. You write a paper and then you move on. But Sue says, in order to impact policy, you need to keep hammering at it. You need to find ways to bring this up. And Dr. Cruz, obviously your work around EGFR is a, a paradigmatic example of like, how do I keep bringing this up in a way that's scientifically and academically responsible? Because everybody's preferred approach is to do what my field did in 1990 when Gibran and, Ta um, Gibran and Tobin did this. And again, in 2005 and 2007, when Bickler showed this uh, same set of findings, let's just move on. Let's just pretend we didn't hear that. We've got other things to go at. And thankfully, our friends at Massimo had some very specific concerns about the quality of our science and went and called my mentees sloppy in public. And um, I don't super love, I mean, you can come at me for a lot of stuff. I'm wrong about a lot of things, but like the notion that my mentees were careless or didn't do the work, that is not an acceptable critique. Thank you very much. And so the two concern, the biggest concern they said is, look, these things are like up to 10 minutes apart and pulse oximetry can vary widely. And so uh, you'd expect some error. Now there's no actual explanation about why that error should be racially differential. Uh, and there never has been. But the great thing about being a CEO of a for-profit company writing in the Orange County uh, Business Journal is perhaps the peer review is a little less rigorous than the New England Journal. And so nobody has ever at forced them to explain why this error, which in this mechanism would result in imprecision, would result in racially differential imprecision, is what it is now. So uh, Val Valbuena is a brilliant uh, future transplant surgeon um, who was working with me as part of the National Commission Scholars, said, well, let's go look. Um, and so the first thing she did was get all the data from ELSO, the Extracorporeal Life Support Organization, uh, which is a big registry of the folks who run ECMO, which is sort of extended cardiopulmonary bypass. And um, ECMO is a really big deal. And so there's really good data quality about it. And every patient who's enrolled on ECMO has a nurse go back and collect a whole bunch of data to get this entered into the ELSO registry. And so a nurse goes and hand matches what is the pulse oximeter uh, reading of the SpO2 and also collects the ABG. And they're supposed to be at the same point about six hours before they go on ECMO. So these people are all sick. They're all in the ICU. They're all about to go on the most invasive thing I can possibly do to a patient. Um, and, uh, and in this very sick patient population, they're all about to go into respiratory failure in the next six hours. Uh, about 9%, 10% of white patients 
had a cold hypoxemia and about 21% of black patients had a cold hypoxemia on this reading that was hand curated by a nurse. Dr. Cooper, did you, did you mean to unmute yourself? Well, I was just saying, uh, saying that someone did type in the chat, Lorise Edwards, uh, can you talk about silent hypoxemia? So I don't know whether you would like to clarify whether occult hypoxemia is the same thing as silent hypoxemia or something different. Um, so silent hypoxemia was, as I understand it, a term kind of invented in COVID to explain these patients who um, seemed hypoxic, but weren't kind of complaining about it. And, um, and um, I guess, let me say, allow me to um, have concerns about the extent to which that is, uh, that was actually a robust finding and a real physiology. These are different things. I think is probably the easiest take home for today. I'm happy to talk in the Q&A or afterwards about that. Um, I'd say in general, one of the weird things is that because our bodies have never really had to evolve for a world where there wasn't enough oxygen for them, um, you don't always get short of breath when, you have, when your blood oxygen is low. And so part of why pulse oximeters are so important is that there aren't good other signs or symptoms that patients aren't getting enough oxygen so we have to say, we have to depend on the pulse oximeter because we cannot depend on them to tell us because by the time their like lips turn purple or something, assuming they're not wearing uh, you know lipstick, um, that's a very late sign, and we we don't want we want to catch it well before that. So you might say maybe the problem is you people in the flyover states don't know how to read your pulse oximeters, and surely at the Johns Hopkins hospitals. This is not a problem. And so some folks who are now my colleagues here, and honestly, the fact that they wrote this paper is one of the reasons that they helped recruit me to this institution, went and looked. And um, they say they were expecting to find this. I'm sorry, I've only been here six months. The Johns Hopkins response to anything is that if you have errors at your system, that's a your system problem. They're assuredly not at our place. So they went and looked and, um, in the bottom left corner is the average difference between the pulse oximeter, the SpO2, and the, uh, the SaO2. And, uh, and for white patients at Johns Hopkins, they're, they're aligned. And, um, and for Black, Asian, and Hispanic patients um, over on Broadway and in the far other hospitals in the data, there's an appreciable 2% gap. And then Ash Fawzi did something brilliant. He said, hey, we've got a whole bunch of medications that are, we want to give in a timely way and that are gated to pulse oximetry. So let's go and look at whether there were differences in whether, when people would have qualified for those medications, if we had actually been able to detect this pulse oximetry, right? So they'd have built a prediction model to guess when the pulse oximeter, if it had been working well, would have actually been low. And part of what they showed is that there is substantial delays for all patients, but particularly if you look at those bottom two lines, there's a whole group of black and Hispanic patients who probably would have benefited from remdesivir and dexamethasone who never qualified for them. And so didn't get them at our hospital because the pulse oximeter never dropped low enough, but their best guess is that maybe one in four of those patients would have qualified had the devices been functioning properly. But a very appreciable gap in what we know are, um, remdesivir is not a great drug. Dexamethasone for hypoxic respiratory failure is one of the titanic breakthroughs of medical science in the last 25 years. And it's an absolutely amazing drug. It works brilliantly, it's cheap, it's great. If you've got hypoxic COVID, you should get dex. Huge differences by race because of the pulse oximeters and whether or not people would have been recognized within four days of being eligible for that. And then Belva Buena said, hey, you think we could study this time period thing? And so she went and we worked, this took a while. We went and looked at all the data in the VA 
across 130 hospitals on patients who were not in the ICU, right? We've been studying ICU patients, but we still draw arterial blood gases on patients on the floor. And sometimes we're getting a pulse ox at the same time. And sometimes you can match those two up. And if you have five years of data for an entire national system, you can go find 30,000 times that those are both recorded at the same moment and look at the difference. And in fact, you have enough data that you can look at how closely the time needs to be the same and see whether you get the same story. So on the right is the replication of the New England Journal of Medicine paper. It's, uh, it's pairs of the blood gas and the pulse oximeter up to 10 minutes apart. You've got your, your, your pulse oximeter sats are on the horizontal axis. And on the vertical axis is just the probability of occult hypoxemia after we do a bunch of risk adjustment and do a little bit of smoothing. And we ask, how often are you missing a true sat less than 88 as a function of your race and your pulse oximeter. And what you see is when you look up to 10 minutes apart, right? Uh, you miss, I don't know, even white patients have about a 20, but black patients have a 25% rate of occult hypoxemia um, among blood gases on the floor. And that, that falls as you get higher, but it doesn't go to zero. And in the lower graph, you see a very consistent five percentage point absolute excess occult hypoxemia rate in African-American veterans compared to white veterans. And then she said, what if we just narrowed the interval, used a little less data, looked at closer matches, and you guys, a bunch of you have done biostatistics. You know, if you have less data, your confidence intervals are going to get bigger. But the confidence intervals, the only things that are changing on this curve all the way up to 2% way over there on this two minutes apart on the side, you see, you know, despite what the CEO of Massimo said, the interval between the blood gas and the pulse oximetry does not explain either the absolute prevalence of occult hypoxemia or the excess occult hypoxemia component. But then Val and I, uh, so we're sitting here thinking about this paper and our colleague Hallie Prescott asked me a question. She said, all right, Jack, if I believe you, how many times do I have to keep getting the blood gas? I said, that's a great question. Because I sort of assumed that this was right, like a melanin associated thing. And so it would be a fixed difference. And so that right, kind of once you knew what for any given patient your recalibration curve needed to be, you might be able to just adjust for it, set a different threshold for each patient. You'd still have to get a bunch of blood gases, but maybe you could live without it. Um, and then in conversation, we realized we could test that. We had patients who had two paired ABG pulse ox readings on the same day. And we could ask is, and this is what the horizontal axis, I'm sorry, this is what the vertical axis is, is how big your gap was on the first paired reading predictive of how big your gap will be on the second paired reading. And let, let me take you through this. So people for whom the pulse oximeter was not working in the morning, it didn't work in the afternoon. So of uh, white patients for whom there was a big gap in the morning, um, even if they had in the left group, you see white patients with a SAT of 92%, in the right group, white patients with a SAT of 98%. If it wasn't working in the morning, they were still you were still going to miss a whole lot of occult hypoxemia in the afternoon. So if it doesn't work, it still doesn't work. That's probably not surprising. Then we went and looked at what about for the patients for whom it's really well aligned, for whom their ABG in the morning tells you exactly the same thing as their pulse ox in the morning? Now, this is going to be much less common among Black patients than it is in white patients, but there'll be some of each. And what you see is it works really well in the afternoon, too, for white patients, right? So folks for whom the blood gas and the SpO2 were really well aligned, if they have a normal saturation in the afternoon, 92 or 98 percent, they're very likely for that to be true. Only two to three percent of them will have a cold hypoxemia. Among that small group of African-American patients for whom the blood gas worked, the pulse oximeter was working in the morning, you still have much larger rates of a cold hypoxemia in the afternoon, right? So um, you're, in the morning, your blood gas and your ABG perfectly correlated. In the afternoon, you've got a SAT of 98%. For some reason, they still get an ABG. 7% of those Black patients 
are going to actually have a true sat of less than 88, even though their pulse oximeter is reading 98. More marginal patients, there are more of those, with a sat of 92%, 12% of those patients who have a normally, a notionally normal pulse oximeter are going to have actually a cold hypoxemia, undetected, dangerously low oxygen. And this seemed to me to be a, an excellent example of what Dr. Fleming was talking about, whose lives are made to matter and whose lives are rendered disposable. There's nothing a well-meaning doctor, nurse, or respiratory therapist can do to, to provide equal care to these patients when in one case, the pulse oximeter is working well, and in one pulse case, the pulse oximeter is working quite poorly. You can't well-meaning your way around that. And uh, the group out at uh, WashU analyzed a bunch of other data. And this isn't quite an ROC curve because it's an engineer. And so they think about ROC curves differently than do. But they basically say, look, you can't fix. There's no cut point you can pick for your black patients that just adjusts away this difference. Then the imprecision, the devices just measure less well. And so you can't use a simple adjustment all right, 88% for white folk, 92% for black patients, that'll be, you can't, the device is just, they're noisier. And so you can't provide the same level of accuracy. And let me give you an intuition about why that is. All right, so Mike Schoding, again, very useful paper in the American Journal of Respiratory and Critical Care Medicine says, let's look at a distribution around folks who have a true measurement of 92%, what their actual arterial blood gas will be. Right, and about 2% will be over in that tail, right, um, of a cold hypoxemia. When you add to that, just 2% bias, one of the kind of bias we've known about for 30 years with these devices, that pushes a lot more people over the threshold. And so a 2% bias by itself gets you to 7% of people who are having a cold hypoxemia because the tails are kind of heavy in a normal distribution, right? They push people over. And if you add just a little more imprecision, a little increase in the standard deviation, then suddenly that error that you thought you could tolerate because it's only 2% in the difference mean is now resulting in 12% versus 2% being across this threshold because despite what all my epidemiology uh, professors have always taught me, not all continuous numbers are continuous, right? I don't really care if your SAT is 95 or 97. I really, really care if your SAT is 85 or 90. And so we've been treating this as if it was a continuous number, when in fact, it's got very sharp thresholds, right? 70, 75, 80, I don't care, I gotta give you more oxygen. 92, 93, 94, 95, I don't care, I gotta give you more, I don't have to give you more oxygen. 85, 90, 95, real sensitivities to decisions. But all the ways we have regulated and measured this continuous device for the last 40 years have all assumed that it was a continuous thing and that any error was all equally the problematic. 72 versus 70, 70 versus 77, 87 versus 94. They all get scooped up the same when you measure a continuous device without clinical nuance. So, turns out, um, back in January, 2021, I had an awesome day. Someone texted me that, um, at the Senator from Massachusetts, um, Elizabeth Warren had, um, had tweeted about my mentee study. And that is a good day. Um, as a mentor, that's about as good of a day as you're going to get. Um, and, uh, and so it turns out, uh, Senators Booker, Senator Wyden, and Senator Warren wrote to, and I know I'm running a little long, I'm gonna speed it up a little bit. Um, the FDA, a wrong letter that basically just rehashed Mike Schoding's paper in the New England Journal in substantially more detail that he was allowed to include in the 450 words of the New England Journal. And then they have this amazing quote. They have just some, some, just some questions. Um, the FDA pulse oximeter guidance from 2000, 2013 recommends that applicants conduct this study and healthy volunteers that includes, and I'm going to quote your FDA regulations here, 
subjects with a range of skin pigmentations, including at least two darkly pigmented subjects or 15% of your subject pool, whichever is larger. Um, and I'm told this, these next few lines are roughly senatorial equivalent for Whiskey Tango Foxtrot. Um, so where did those numbers come from and any idea? Um, and have you reviewed this guidance in the last decade? Um, and so uh, the FDA says basically nothing. <laughs> Um, and then in August 2022, um, Senators Markey and Senate Tammy Duckworth from um, Illinois write back after the Johns Hopkins study and say in somewhat more forceful terms, hey, what's going on? And oh, by the way, you never got back to us about the last letter and we're sitting U.S. senators. You're really supposed to respond. And then the FDA says, um, oh, we're going to have a committee meeting. Um, and so they do on, um, and these are some slides from the FDA. Um, and again, right, like good days. This is the timeline as they present it. Note that there's no mention of the Gibran and Tobin piece in 1990 or the uh, Bixler work in 2005 and 2007, but they say uh, in 2013, we released this pre pre our pre-market notification submissions, then COVID-19 happened. Again, good days. When your mentee, one of whom is going up for tenure, can include an FDA slide that cites their paper as a crucial turning point in the FDA's decision making, it makes, I think, writing your tenure packet a little easier. Um, and then they say, well, we sent out a communication saying maybe don't use pulse oximeters for exactly the way that we're recommending you use pulse oximeters for other medical, uh, never use pulse oximeters in the absence of other medical devices. They have an advisory committee meeting. They go through a whole bunch of stuff that basically says, actually, we don't, uh, first thing they do is they point out that they don't regulate over the counter pulse oximeters. So that pulse oximeter, you may have encouraged some of you, your grandma to get. It turns out that is for recreational purposes only, um, for camping in the event that you wanna climb a mountain and go, look at that, my pulse ox is a little low, <laughs> which is not, I would contend the way many uh, physicians engaged in home triage, or some of us when trying to decide whether we're trying to get relatives to go get Paxilvid, have been using those home oximeters. Apparently there's no medical role for them. There's just a burgeoning market of them as recreational devices for people who are curious. And then they point out there's a bunch of, um, that they've actually outsourced the guidance for this to the International Standards Organization, which publishes guidance on how to do this. Um, and they basically say, uh, so do you think it demonstrates disparate performance in patients with darker skin pigmentation? And the committee's talk the committee members talking to um, newspapers afterwards said, yes, yes, we do. Uh, one of the committee members, in fact, suggested that perhaps a black box warning should be put out from the FDA about uh, overall disparity, overall inaccuracies in pulse oximeters and racial disparities in that. That was November 1st, November 7th. Um, uh, uh, nothing has changed. Um, and so like, look, clearly technology alone is not gonna solve this problem, right? Um, Cause this is not part of why you're having me here is because this isn't the only story, right? There's also the algorithms to estimate uh, healthcare needs that Ruha Benjamin wrote such a beautiful editorial on in science um, that used uh, observed healthcare as a proxy for healthcare needs. And so if you have racially disparate um, differences in access, you reliably reproduce those in terms of who got benefits of case management. Pulmonary function tests, right, were just like, just way more racist. Um, they used norms and said, well, like, yeah, we think in the 1860s that probably African-Americans whose lungs were able to test probably had the same life experiences as, um, as white soldiers. Um, and the fact that they're different uh, was, was really obviously, right, they framed as evidence of their eugenics belief um, that African-Americans should not be allowed to serve in the Union Army. There's a whole um, Baltimore story about that around asbestos that you should look into, right? It's not a problem alone and the tech keeps doing it. But Daniel Kalan Hidalgo and some of his colleagues wrote a piece in the Lancet Respiratory Medicine that they pointed out that tech responds to money. And so what these trainees did and in a beautiful um, editorial said, we call on hospitals to commit to only purchasing pulse oximeters that have been shown to equally to work equally well in patients of color. And that seems like a pretty reasonable thing to ask a hospital to do. Like don't buy a device that you know is racist. So how would we know? 
So I'm going to contend that there's likely an expertise gap between the Center for Health Equity and the average purchasing division of a large healthcare system. And the purchasing division doesn't want to have to figure out what good enough is. They want to have some standard that somebody else uses, and they say, we just buy the cheapest version of whatever meets the standard that the clinicians are told. So in that context, can we trust the companies to do it? Well, here's a piece from Stat News where Massimo says, I believe there's racial bias in the treatment of patients. I believe Caucasians get better treatment than black and brown people, but it's not the pulse oximeter. It's not our pulse oximeter. CNN, in response to the discussion, makers of pulse oximeters reported that their studies show no evidence of racial bias in the accuracy of their devices. So I'm gonna suggest maybe we can't trust this set of three companies to set the standards for themselves because they've already said, as far as we can tell, this isn't a problem. We don't know what you sloppy scientists are going on about. And here's where the biostatistics and the part of expertise that Johns Hopkins comes in. Because I got to pivot from this sort of conversation about regulations to comments about non-inferiority trials and how a non-inferiority trial is different than a superiority trial. So most of the clinical trials we run are superiority trials, right? We want to show that whatever the thingy we're testing is, is affirmatively better than placebo, right? It works better than whatever your option is. And in order to do that, you have to show the mean is at least some bigger amount different, bigger than a minimally clinically important difference, and that the standard errors, the confidence interval is small enough to confirm that that mean is different than the other thing. In contrast, sometimes you can run clinical trials that are non-inferiority where what you're trying to show is it's no worse, right? So we do this in ID all the time. Dapsone was no worse for endocarditis than vancomycin. New drug of the new ACE inhibitor is no worse than whatever your standard ACE inhibitor is. And for there, what you're trying to show is you set a unacceptably worse boundary and you're trying to prove after you do your clinical trial that the difference is not worse than unacceptably worse. The problem with that in this graphic is this assumes that the superiority trial and the non-inferiority trial were drawn, were run with the same accuracy and excellence, and so the confidence intervals are the same. Because there's another way you can do this. You can show non-inferiority by running a really bad clinical trial. And as you run a really bad clinical trial, as you get more and more crossover, your standard errors get bigger, and then you go, I can't see a difference. Right? So if you're trying to tell if Lisa Cooper and Jack Iwashina are different heights, you want to be able to see those pictures really clearly and see us next to each other in a fair way. But if you are got a substantial and financial interest in arguing that Lisa Cooper and Jack Iwashina are the same height, you look at the two of us on Zoom and you go, I don't know, it looks like Dr. Cooper's head is about the same place Dr. Iwashina's head is. I'm guessing Lisa Cooper and Jack Iwashina are the same, right? If you're trying, and the non-inferiority trial is your hypothesis, a badly run measurement works in favor. Unlike in most randomized clinical trials where if you do it badly, it works against your interests. If you're trying to prove non-inferiority, if you're trying to prove racial equity, that your device works as well in black patients as it does in white patients, if you're not careful, a badly run trial makes it easier to show that than a well-run trial. And this is why we have federal regulations, right? So on food, it turns out if you let people just say, it's going to make you thin, they will put, it's going to make you thin on all kinds of things, including potato chips, cookies, and um, hot dogs. And so we have labeling standards that define exactly how, as a result of substantial ongoing science across a number of different bodies, you should be able to label things so that someone who wants to purchase a low sodium food can in fact find out if it is a low sodium food. My core contention is right now, there is no reliable way for a hospital that wants to pick a device or algorithm that works equitably to know that that device or algorithm work, works equitably, except taking the person who's trying to sell it to them's word for it. And that's a dangerous, dangerous thing. 
And then indeed, in order to put together these evidentiary standards, you need to bring together an unusual perspective. And I can't think of many places in the country, although I can think of one, where you can get the clinical folks who are there to make sure we align the testing with the range of where the clinical decisions are being made. The biostatistical folks who know how to think about we ensure adequate power and how we define minimal clinically important differences for equity evaluation. How do you do that in a way that's not a bunch of professors sitting in a room but engages the community? That also involves critical race perspectives that ask how do we report racial disparities in function that doesn't reify some faux biological notion of race and re-embed this, and without assuming that skin tone is the operative component of race when that has not been shown. And pretty much every time we just assume we know what makes for racial differences in biology, somebody gets it wrong because it's usually based on some prior assumption. How do we think about the regulatory sciences where we adequately specify the underlying distribution of hypoxemia to be tested? What are we making the trade-offs between doing this in healthy volunteers versus demanding that be done in our target patient populations of folks who are actually sick? And what other shenanigans can people, device manufacturers engage in? Because you know there are other shenanigans that I have not been able to think of. And the engineers to say, how do we do this all in a cost-effective way so that it can create a market for better devices as opposed to getting everybody to opt out of the market entirely and keep trying to compete on their grandfather devices? I don't know. But I kind of know the bright people who might want be able to know. And I want to suggest that a federal agency is not going to lead on this. Um, particularly not with uh, the new house, but that the John Hopkins evidentiary standards for equity in medical devices and algorithms could be a thing that we could do in sort of an initial thought piece, a set of working guidelines, and then a broader research program where we lay out for people who want to make a claim that their device is equitable or after your student activists force the hospital administration to admit they'll only purchase equitable devices. How do we actually make sure that the students don't get taken advantage of? That the devices that they were buying under a label of equitable actually do hit, hit a reasonable standard of equity. So that was the pitch I promised you I was gonna end with. Now let me end by telling you what I told you. So contemporary social scientific understandings of racism do not require individual racial animus for racism to produce meaningful differences in whose lives are valued. Pulse oximeters, which are used to, accept, to triage access to oxygen, access to the hospital, access to the ICU, are a critical medical technology. And they systematically err and underdetect life-threatening hypoxemia in African-American patients and are less precise in a way that makes it essentially impossible to just bedside adjust around this. That ongoing policy discussions are occurring, but have not fixed anything. And technology alone won't solve this. There's an urgent need for regulatory interventions to make possible market competition by more equitable devices. I think there are places out there that are willing to pay more for devices that would work in all their patients. Right now, there's no way for them to prove that they work more by a fair standard for them to be able to be rewarded for that innovation. I think Hopkins can fix that. And I think we gotta do some work, right? So let me end with this quote from, um, from Professor Glaude uh, down at, at Princeton, right? That sincerity can often mask cruelty, especially the cruelty of conscious disavowal. Progress entails more than condemning any, any given politician. Progress necessitates an honest confrontation and condemnation with one's complicity with a way of life, a practice, a style of practice and with medical devices that insists that some people matter more than others and with a society organized to reflect that belief. We can't fix it all at once, but we can begin fixing it in lots of little places. And this has been my effort to make a contribution to that. Thank you so much, Dr. Cooper and Dr. Cruz for having me here. I'm, I'm really, uh, I'm honored to be there, here. And I, I welcome the conversation afterwards. Thank you so much. <laughs> See all the, um signs of applause and appreciation for such a provocative and um, uh, so- Dr. Cooper, if you're, <coughs> so if you're talking, I cannot hear you. Oh, <coughs> can other people hear me? <coughs> Excuse me. Oh, okay. I, I can hear you, but you're a little uh, quiet. You guys can uh, hear me so coughing, right? Yeah, we can hear you coughing. Uh, let's but, uh, try getting rid of but, that. 
Yeah, so I, just turned, I just turned my volume up. Can you hear me? Now? I was just saying thank you so much for such a provocative and sobering presentation, but uh, a real call to action too um, in this this critically uh, important area, which I think even though it seems like there's awareness of the issues that there's a lack of, of progress and timely progress on it. Um, so anyway, and thank you for your, your leadership as well. Are there questions for Jack from the group? I know people were looking at that data very, very carefully. I see one from Valencia Humson. Thank you so much for such a wonderful talk. Um, my name is Valencia Kumsen. I'm an associate professor at Tufts University in electrical and computer engineering. Um, and in my lab, we've been working on some innovative pulse oximeter devices to address this issue. Um, and I had a question about some of the short-term solutions um, for uh, this issue. I, I wanted to get a sense of, you know, how, how, you know, what is the level of awareness amongst care providers, both nurses, physician assistants, physicians, in critical care units of the FDA safety advisories around pulse oximeters and their limitations? Is there a general awareness about these uh, limitations? So it's always hard, right? Because anyone I would ask would probably know that it was my work I was asking if they knew about. And I do in a general role, try to avoid the like, have you read my important work on this topic <laughs> on rounds? My general sense is not much because nobody really knows what to do. Um, and so uh, there's sort of a sense that it's like not super awesome, um, but there's also been an enormous amount of pressure over the last 10 years in critical care to avoid doing arterial blood gases and avoid putting in arterial lines. Um, and so in the world where like Johns Hopkins taught us, always take that line out the second you can. And there's a little part of me that wants to leave that line in, which is the essential alternative to this. Nobody's quite sure whether the risk of hypoxemia which seems to me really big, is bigger than the risk of line infection, which is really small. So I am, um, there, there's a bit of a like, right? You can't beat something with nothing. So we need somebody to bring to market a device that actually works um, that, that can be replaced by it. Um, yeah. Thanks, uh, Dr. Cruz. Yeah, well, Jack, thank you so much. This is tremendous. And you know, I'm already sold to try to uh, partner with you on this on this work. So um, really tremendous. I did, um, I had a, well, a couple things, I, one comment and then a question. I was, I was really struck by, you know, what you shared about the letter that you, you that came into your, or the tweet that came from some senators um, about your mentees work. A similar thing happened over in the kidney space, but it was in the form of a letter from some senators that just said, hey, you know, hey, what gives with this, this um, kidney function algorithm? And so I, I do think there's a lot of power as you, as you talked about, uh, you know, to, to be kind of garnered in the setting of when, when elected officials are sort of even, even calling attention to this. So I think um, exciting to see that that, that, that energy is there. Um, I was wondering, you know, clinically, um, how how useful is checking an ambulatory O2 saturation? So think, thinking about, you know, in the while we're advocating for better uh, pulse oximeters, which you know, as you talked about, all the all the things that need to happen in order for us to get to that place, what could be done even right now? So I was just I was thinking about like, do, do ambulatory saturations help with any of this? Yeah, so it's a great question. Um, so let me first put on my epi hat and say that I can't actually tell you if essentially stressed, um, right, kind of uh, what I think of this is you, you engage in a cardiopulmonary stress in order to try to get them to, to drop their true sat and then see if they actually drop their sat. Um, uh, so I don't, I can't prove to you. I can tell you that I do, particularly for people who have, like when I get called, as I often do with, hey, so it turns out I've got COVID and I feel like crap. Should I go get Paxlovid or not? And this is not endorsement of Paxlovid. And I, uh, Lauren, you might want to edit this part out before this goes up on YouTube because uh, this is not medical advice. See your own healthcare provider. Um, I tell them to walk up the stairs with the pulse oximeter on. And if their SAT doesn't drop, uh, it encourages me. And if their SAT does drop, that scares me. I suspect it's sensitive, but not specific. 
So, right, I think if you see it, right, if the device notices you're sat dropping, that's probably bad and you should treat that. Um, I am unsure and the and Val's BMJ paper with the um, makes me worried that the pulse oximeters may be less effective at noticing the dropping sat that is truly occurring in African-American patients. Um, yeah. It's an EKG, yeah. right? If it's there, it's a problem, but if it's not there, you're probably not right. definitely done. And if you accept that as definitely done, you're probably gonna engage in racially and gender desperate care. Yeah. I worry, and somebody should do that study. So the, the only alternative we have in the meantime is to really go back to having arterial lines or doing blood gases. We know nobody wants like blood gases. Um, and a lot of people, even probably African-American patients themselves would be resistant to the idea of having a more sort of invasive line put in, you know, but it, but it is, I mean, I don't know, this is really a problem. I think this is what happens when you discover an, an issue and you don't have an answer for it. Um, it, it, it almost calls to mind for me when we identified that racial implicit racial bias was affecting communication with patients and was playing a role, but we really didn't know what to do about it. And we still don't know exactly what to do about it. But, you know, I think you have to do whatever the next best thing is in the meantime. But it certainly sounds like technology that there is a possibility of correcting this. It's not as if there's not the the knowledge in place to do something about it. I don't know, even while studying it, right? Yeah, so I think, you know, right, there are a couple of things about this that drive me crazy. Mm -hmm. um, the first is the extent to which I might be able to have a workaround in the ICU. And I can probably get a workaround on the floor where you can draw an arterial blood gas and mm -hmm. maybe in the ED. But Dr. Cooper, you run a general and general medicine practice, right? Yeah, you can't. Right? You don't have an ABG in your clinic, do you? In like the global South, yeah. right? To be yeah. clear, what we're saying is these devices work well in a small minority of Northern Europeans, yeah. right? That when you think about the global South and the problems, right? Like you, I can't recommend yeah. widespread dissemination of arterial blood gas machines right. and the recalibration components when you're trying to. And so uh, the international health implications of this are, are just terrifying to me um, in a world where we think about COVID and its continued loss, as well as the extent to which HIVs, um, pretend, right, treatable final complications are so often pulmonary, right? Pneumonia remains a number one killer around the globe. So that's this. Um, the second part is, this is a dumb one. Right, yeah. like our best guess about why these things are is that they did their validation studies to develop the particulars, right? The, the thing that goes from the actual wave mm -hmm. to a number is not mathematically defined. Mm -hmm. Basically what happens is you do a validation study in a bunch of people, and then you hardwire into the chip, the signal processing that is the calibration curve for this amount of flux equals a 95. This amount of flux equals a 97. Literally what um, Gibran and Tobin suggested in 1990 was like, don't tell us the number, mm -hmm. just show us the data mm -hmm. and then print out different cards for different patients. So you could look up what that number is yourself, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, right? That this is essentially a problem that low cost devices, as far as we can tell, have these things hardwired as opposed to software updatable mm -hmm. and no one has done the recalibration. Now, it sounds like our colleagues from Tuff may be busy, um, not just doing the recalibration, but thinking of better parts and there are reasons to want to make these devices more precise. Mm -hmm. But in the meantime, you could also just make them not biased by recalibrating on a racially diverse population. And as far as I can tell, nobody's done that because there's no way for them to do that in the current regulatory regime and say, look, it works better. Spend $10 million, which is probably what it costs to get a single hospital to change all those pulse oximeters that there are in every room mm -hmm. to buy my new one. Yeah. But if you could, you can imagine that's it, right. If you can create that market, mm -hmm. yeah, there's some capitalism. Because can I mention one other statistic, Lisa? Sure, sure. I want to make sure Erica gets to ask her oh, question. Sorry. No, it's okay. $2.4 billion is what the international market 
for pulse wow. oximeters is wow. each year, wow. $2.4 billion. And a Forbes statistic quotes Massimo's margin on their in-hospital devices is 65%. Mm -hmm. Like there's a market here if we can find some way to let capitalism do its thing. Mm -hmm. Sorry, Erica. Yeah. Go ahead, Erica. Thank you so much for your uh, presentation. I was a University of Michigan medical school graduate. So Go um, blue. it was great. Go blue. Um, one, one question that I had is, has your research in this area led you or other of your colleagues um, thinking that the technology for other transcutaneous devices may need to be investigated? I'm a pediatrician, and so transcutaneous, transcutaneous bilirubin is really being pushed in a lot of newborn nurseries, um, and also transcutaneous life to perform procedures like blood cultures is something that's really commonly done in neonatal intensive care units. Um, and I was, I was wondering if those technologies need to be, or maybe are being investigated as well. Um, so I suspect so in part because two other stories right there, are there are already anecdotal concerns about how well um, the new pulse oximeter in Apple watches, which use a different technology, um, sort of racialized differences in who those pick up for. And then in JAMA two months ago, um, there's a, three months ago, there's a piece on, um, uh, thermometers mm -hmm. and thermometers um, at Emory. Uh, they just did a great study. They looked at people who didn't get Tylenol, right? So no component and just compared thermometers to um, right the visual, the light thermometers to uh, temperatures, to oral temperatures. Um, and uh, the, the light thermometers missed a quarter of fevers in African-American patients. Right, and we all know, uh, right, as a pediatrician, has a fever, doesn't have a fever, is a very fundamental triage point in how you think about sepsis and how you think about kids and whether you're getting an LP for that kid and how fast they get antibiotics. Um, and uh, yeah, so yes, I, I have, I ha one could make, I'm not necessarily making it, a strong claim that there should be a presumption at this point of potential bias and that the onus is on people who want to use non-contact devices to actually prove that they work equitably, not that they not give them the presumption that of course they work fine and then wait five years, as Dr. Cooper said, to go out and try to find it afterwards once they're already disseminated, for which you would need standards. Yeah. It wow. scares me. It is. It is. Well, I think you have, you've identified some people here who are willing to be comrades with you on this journey. And it's good to hear that the policymakers are also like similarly um, impassioned about it too. So um, continuing to work with them, I think is uh, going to be really, really important. Yeah, so, um, hey, I'm the only Iwashina at Hopkins. Like, it is really easy to find me in any given directory, <laughs> right? Coopers are hard to find. Iwashinas are easy. Please send me an email if you're interested in this. Um, I think we're hoping to get together a group in um, January, early February to develop a real work, set of work plans and some product streams. And, um, and I, uh, there are reason to think there's, uh, there's, a, there's potentially real support for this. So I'd be really grateful if people are interested. Awesome. Well, I hope everybody heard that. And thank you for being with us. And um, thank you, Dr. Awashna, for uh, helping us, um, you know, be aware of, of things that we can be involved in as scientists and as community uh, activists and as advocates for, for health equity. And wishing everyone a happy holiday season, happy new year. We look forward to seeing you all in 2023. All right. Bye, everyone. Thanks. Thank you so much again.